Hi. Basically, we are interested in a number of areas of research that really have to do with humans, the interaction with technology, the development of knowledge through those practices. And uh, there's uh, probably no one that I would rather have that would uh, be able to sort of help lead some of the discussion on where technology is going and the impact of technology, particularly technology that relates to <coughs> Uh, intelligent agents, another activity than, uh, than Professor Art Fraser. He's someone I've known for, uh, well, I think, in person for about uh, three years now, but uh, certainly known of his research well before that. It's certainly seminal and uh, leading edge research on a number of fronts. I certainly have a look at the students he supervised and the number of publications that he's had and currently I think you're ineligible for any additional NSF grants because you're on 10. <laughs> no, no, not just NSF, but I'm on 10 grants. Okay, so so needless to say, Art's got a pretty busy schedule and for even just to have him here is a huge privilege and an honor for me. So Art, thanks very much for joining us. Look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, George. It's an honor to be here, but a little bit bewildering. How do you give a talk to a place with George and others that know more about learning than anybody else in the world. So, uh, you know, and hopefully I can say a couple of things that uh, might be new to George and his colleagues. So I'm going to talk about agents and scientific principles of learning. And uh, one of the things I'm doing now, I, I, well, how many here have heard of the book How People Learn? I don't know, I know at least George does. Uh, that is one of the top five downloads and sellers in the National Academy of Sciences in its entire history. Uh, that's with Bransford, uh, Brown, and uh, I think it's Coxon or something like that. It was back in 1990, no, two, it's about 2000. And so I'm on the board to write edition two. <laughs> and it's bewildering because that was a very visionary book and trying to replicate that will be nearly impossible. And part of the reason it's impossible is learning is complicated these days. Um, I've noticed, maybe I'll stand up, easier on my back. Um, you have psychology has its theories. You have education, has its theories. It has machine learning, has its theories. It has computer learning environments. All of these have their own conferences, and there's very few people at the intersection. The learning sciences was supposed to be that. However, if you go to the learning sciences conference, you find that uh, they either probably go to dinner in their own camps, <laughs> Or, um, it, you know, it hasn't solved gluing this together, so it's a little bewildering, uh, this next edition of How People Learn. So, what I want to do, here's an overview. I want to say a little bit about the importance of digital learning environments that incorporate scientific principles of learning. Okay? Then, uh, a little bit about conversational learning environments with conversational agents. And finally, I want to mention two learning environments that may benefit from becoming MOOCs or blended learning environments. And um, especially this one, Cecil Autotutor, uh, and this is just briefly a couple of minutes. This is a serious game that I did with Pearson Education, but they abandoned it. And so now we want to resuscitate it and maybe put it in the form of a MOOC. So that'll only be a couple of minutes. But I did have to sit, make that comment about Pearson education. Make sure you read your contracts very carefully when you deal with them. OK. During the last decade, I've been a part of a number of learning commu communities that have wanted to talk about principles of learning, science-based principles of learning. And, um, you know, you've had the Institute of Education Sciences. There was a joint group between psychology, uh, APS and APA. There was the National Science Foundation, Army, National Academy of Sciences. All of them want to know about these principles of learning. 
that you could train teachers on. And um, let me give you some examples. Uh, this is the one for struggling learners. This, uh, these are a list of them that they thought were based on science and also they work. They produce learning games. And I'm not going to go through all of these. Uh, these were the ones out of Institute of Education Sciences. Uh, some of them are pretty obvious, like space learning over time, interleave worked example solutions with problem solving. Uh, this was my favorite one, ask deep explanatory questions as opposed to a who, what, when, where. Um, and qu quizzing, uh, quizzing to promote learning, things like that. And um, so the question is, do teachers use these principles? That's what I want to briefly address. So the National Council on Teacher Quality commissioned a study where they analyze 48 textbooks that are popular today on education that they have in professional development and 48 teacher education programs in the United States. Okay, so they wanted to say, and they asked to what extent were six out of the seven strategies identified in the textbooks in their curriculum. Okay, so here's a summary of the study. Let me read it. In summary, not one textbook covers all six fundamental instructional strategies. In fact, no textbook covers more than two. Moreover, through their coursework, most programs prepare candidates in only a single strategy and fail to address the remaining five. Almost one third of the programs fail to prepare candidates for even a single strategy. So whatever it is that these scientific communities are creating, it doesn't look like it's being implemented in either the textbooks or the curricula. And by the way, they've had deans of education respond to it, and most of them go through denial. Uh, they say, we teach it, you know, but you look at the actual, you know, the text. And, and by the way, what they counted as covering it is at least two sentences. So they had a very liberal uh, definition of whether it's being covered. So now you get this kind of study. I don't know how many people have read this, that billions of dollars in annual teacher training is largely a waste. This has been uh, documented, and in fact, IES had a call for professional development because they were looking at the outcome measures on uh, teacher training, and the news is not good. Well, one hypothesis for this, and it's a complicated problem, there's no single solution, obviously, but one reason is they're not applying scientific principles of learning. It's just not being implemented and executed. It's just not there. Uh, whatever they're doing, whether you consider it educational folklore, whatever they're doing, it's not based on scientific principles of learning. And so, but the good news is all six principles of learning have been implemented on digital computers and have shown learning games. So this could lead to the argument that digital environments may not just be a luxury, it may be necessary, absolutely necessary, before we're going to at least have these scientific-based principles executed. Now, you know, everybody wants deeper learning in the 21st century, right? Um, shallow learning isn't going to the distance to get you jobs uh, that will pay reasonable salaries. So you want people who are systems thinkers, problem solvers, very good inquiry and good questions, taking a critical stance, being skeptical, and so they can do research in order to come up with counter solutions and everything. And you get your Bloom's taxonomy on all this, and a lot of what happens is in this region, not this region. <coughs> and that's where computers can play an important role. Um, so there's a core illusion of instructors in higher education that deep learning occurs by assigned readings and carefully prepared lectures. And this is where most of the education takes place. They assign a textbook and they give lectures, right? That's 
That's how education takes place, right? Well, one of my favorite studies that I ever was involved with, with Kurt Van Lane, we had a randomized control trial on four conditions. This is physics and with something like the physics concept inventory as an outcome measure, something that required reasoning, not just memorization. So he compared a human tutor PhDs through computer-mediated conversation with auto-tutor. This is one of my favorite tutors that helps people learn by holding a conversation in natural language. You had a reading a textbook for an equivalent amount of time versus doing nothing. So which condition do you think they learned the most? How many vote the human tutor? Okay. How many vote auto-tutor? Aha, you'll get your $20 on the way out. Yeah. <laughs> How about reading the textbook? Okay. <coughs> How about doing nothing? Just checking. Yeah, okay. So here's the data. This is adjusted post-test scores, controlling for pretest on the force concept inventory sort of thing. We were very happy to, happy to see that the human tutor and auto tutor were almost the same. That's great news. But can anybody see anything else interesting about this? <coughs> Better off not reading. <laughs> <laughs> or at least there's no difference than not reading at all. Doing the textbook gives you shallow knowledge, exposure to topic, or decent exposure. <laughs> You give a slide, I take it to my class first. <laughs> and you can say, I'm going home, get on the computer, right? <laughs> so it's not only in physics, it's in computer literacy. This is critical thinking, critical scientific reasoning. Just giving somebody a textbook and just giving a lecture, it's not doing it. You're wallowing in shallow waters. And that's the best you can do. It's a great technology for that. And it was created, classrooms and reading textbooks created in the Industrial Revolution when you could train people for shallow knowledge. But we're now in the 21st century and you need more reasoning, problem solving, etc. So there's a poverty. Max, you a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you said shallow knowledge for industrial revolution. Can you explain that? Just so yeah. During the industrial revolution, they wanted to train a lot of people to do very repetitive tasks, usually in factories, procedural tasks, memorization of a few things. The memory and executing these rigid procedures was primarily uh, what they wanted. And, and what you wanted is an educational system that would prepare industry for that. And so what's the most efficient way of doing it? It's very efficient to deliver information by lecture and just giving things out in a textbook, but that has no guarantee. And that people can be exposed to, to information that way. However, the deep reasoning <coughs> isn't going to go. So that's it's like what we're doing in STEM fields today. But. Yeah. In STEM fields to where you're wanting more <coughs> active learning. Right. Yeah, more active, interactive. And part of the claim is you have to have that more interactivity. Just giving them a textbook isn't going to do it. Yeah. So we know that when you look at people read, discourse comprehension is pretty poor. We know from meta-analyses uh, that um, the correlation between a student's impression of how well they understand text and their actual understanding of the text is only 0.27. So for the most part, students don't know whether they're understanding it if you if just have them normally read. And that partially explains why just giving them a textbook uh, isn't doing the trick. Um, you need to have a more adaptive and interactive uh, environment, more feedback, uh, more kind of tasks assigned that are within their zone or pushing the zone. Um, we also know that individual students cannot control the pacing of information in lectures. 
you've probably been in lectures where you can get in about 10 minutes and then you get lost, you drop off. What you get the rest of the way is tenuous at best. Um, it, it's almost like when you ask for directions in a city, you stop there and say, so where is City Hall? And they go, blah, 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 and by sentence two, you're lost. And of course, you just go to the next person iteratively <laughs> until hopefully you finally get there. Um, and we know by looking at mind wandering uh, research, uh, when, the, when the material's not at the right level of difficulty, students tend to mind wander. We have some mind wandering aficionados here, like Catherine and George, and maybe some others. And so, so this partially <coughs> explains why it's no real recipe for deeper learning in the 21st century to just assign textbooks and listening to lectures. So, of course, one future of education is MOOCs. And of course, you have this. This is probably a picture that's all over. This is the favorite picture on the web of George. How old is that picture? I, I, how old is that picture? Uh, I'm not sure, but I can find out. For you. <laughs> <laughs> so we have George. This is uh, connectivism, books, learning analytics, social interaction. You know, uh, you know. I do think that having the computer good computer materials where you can have more interactive environments, I think, I think that's, part of, that's one future solution. We've got to wait for a picture. Okay, so here's, here's what my proposal is. Let's add conversational agents to the learning environment. <coughs> and we know that m many types of learning, especially difficult problems to solve, Having social interaction is important, but it's not necessarily the case that there's a person around all the time. Well, you can get part of the way there, not the full way there, by having these agents, these automated cyber conversational agents. And so that's what I've been developing since 1997, these pedagogical agents that hold conversations in natural language and interact with the learner in hopefully intelligent ways. Uh, for example, one of my favorite is these is two agents in a human. Okay, you can figure out many interesting things when there's two agents in a human. So if the student doesn't know much, the human doesn't know much at all, then you can have the expert. Um, uh, interact with another student agent, by, and they, they can observe them vicariously, but then the two agents periodically turn to the human and ask them like a yes-no question on what they think. So it's not like total vicarious, just observing. It's they periodically turn to the learner and ask an easy question. Um, and so that's one. Now, if the, if the human is very high in knowledge and skill, then you can get them to try to teach an agent, a fellow agent. So those who can teach, okay? So, um, but then if they don't do too well, the expert agent can look over and say, hmm, uh, they need a little bit of help to get an, a better trajectory. So they'll give a hint to get the two of them better off. That's the idea. So the other uh, sort of thing, uh, if they're intermediate, you can have the standard sort of tutorial interaction. So uh, trialogues, we call them trialogues, low ability vicarious learning, medium ability tutorial dialogue, high ability teachable agent. So you can also look at trialogues in assessment. So if the human their low ability, if they just have short responses to prompt, or they're wrong or irrelevant, take little initiative, they violate social norms. Some of them, they say all sorts of things in the discourse, <laughs> and you want to kind of get them to pay attention to the material. So all, you can mine the data and uh, try to detect whether they're low ability versus high ability just by the nature of the interaction. 
We're working with ETS, actually, with these agents in assessment environments. Um, so uh, in this virtual world, you will you'll figure out how to assess their speaking, listening, reading, and writing in a virtual interaction that lasts less than an hour. And the way they do it is with these agents, one is this is kind of like a library environment, and this is a sign you hope they read, and one of them is no food or drink is allowed in the library. So here you have a doofus agent that bungles and, you know, and a smarty pants agent. And so you, the human converses with both of them, and they not only see what they do, so you will see this doofus agent walk in to the library with a bottle of water, and you see whether the human says, hey, stop, uh, you know, you're, didn't you read no food or drink is allowed in the library? Well, that would be a student with a lot of initiative. And they, so you know that they can read, and you know that they can communicate, uh, speak by doing that. There is speech recognition with this. Uh, so sometimes they type, sometimes they speak. So now it may be that they're just timid. So um, suppose the doofus agent walks in and then the smarty pants agent might ask the human, well, what do you think uh, of uh, the doofus agent going in there? And so that's prompting them and see how they respond. And so you can actually find out by this conversational interaction uh, whether, they're, whether they understood it. So it may be when they're prompted, they'll say, if she asks them, uh, is food or drink allowed in the library? And they say no, yeah, if they say yes, then you know they haven't read it. And, and since they've been prompted, uh, to speak, they might not be able to even speak it, so you try to figure out whether it's a speaking problem, reading problem, and a communication problem of various sort. So there's many functions of these conversational agents. You can give them help when initiated by a user. So very often a lot of people say, don't force the agents on them. Just have the student be a self-regulated learner that knows exactly what their knowledge deficits are and can correct them and only turn to a source when needed. And that ha happens 3% of the time. The conditional probability that a person asks for help on a computer environment when they need help is only 3%. So you'll be waiting for Godot if you rely on this. Uh, agents can be a navigational guide. That's another thing, and often students don't know what to do next in an environment. They just, what's next? Um, the agents can model good action and thinking and social interaction. They can stage arguments to prompt deeper learning. This is an area that Sidney DeMello and I have done a lot on. Uh, we think a lot of deeper learning comes can come from disputes and arguments uh, where you put people in cognitive disequilibrium and they have to reason themselves out of it and so uh, so staging good arguments is good and of course you want adaptive intelligent intelligent conversational dialogue and you can have many roles you can have peers, tutors, mentors. They can have different personalities. You can have adversarial agents. You can be hel have helpful agents. You can have compassionate agents. You can have all these different agents. And uh, now, since I've been in Memphis, we started out analyzing human tutoring in great depth. Then we built Auto Tutor, this natural language sort of. Um, agent and then now it's just expanded to all of these projects and there's so many i feel like i have academic attention deficit <laughs> aadd yeah uh, uh, and that's good stress right that's what everybody tells me <laughs> um so what i want to do is primarily talk about this system because 
this system George seemed to resonate most when he visited us in Memphis. And this is an auto tutor system for our Center for the Study of Adult Literacy. Uh, I've been working a lot with adults in the last few years of my career rather than K-12 because the politics in Memphis is uh, virtually impossible to get into the school system. Shelby County sued the city of Memphis, so they had a five or six year lawsuit. Academia can't get in there. But in fact, we have an efficacy study in mathematics. We have to go 100 miles away uh, in order to do our research. So Memphis has its challenges. And, but nobody cares about the adults. I mean, they're a neglected population, which means you can help them, you know. Uh, so we have the Center for the Study of Adult Literacy. It's the only funded cent research center in the United States. That's how much it's neglected. And there's, uh, we developed 35 modules to help them in comprehension skills. Comprehension skills are important because most teachers don't know how to teach it. For reading comprehension, they may know phonics and vocabulary, but comprehension is very difficult to teach. It's very abstract. Uh, professional development has not excelled in that area. And so uh, th that's the part that we play. And if there's time, I might not get to it, but uh, if there's time, I'll talk about operation areas for scientific reasoning. So this is the Center for the Study of Adult Literacy. You, we know that there's 50 to 70 million adults in the United States who, who don't read at a deep enough level for them to get a decent job. And uh, a lot of them, some of them are immigrants, some of them just were never motivated, some of them are products of extreme poverty, uh, but for whatever reason it is, they don't read at an eighth grade level. And the group we're interested in is between the third and eighth grade coming in. So imagine they go to a literacy center, an adult literacy center, and want help with their reading. Which interestingly, only 4% of adult of these 50 million actually go to a center, which is amazing. So 96% could benefit from going to a center but they, for whatever reason, don't. It may be they don't know about it. It may be they're working three jobs. It may be, but for whatever reason it is, they don't go. And expanding, uh, you know, help with literacy is something that we'd like. Here's an interesting thing. One third of college students at a state university, Memphis, <laughs> uh, do not read at the eighth grade level. So uh, I bet you there would be a certain percentage here at this university who are not reading at the eighth grade level. And um, so what we're doing is building a science on this. And we have an intervention that we've tested out in Atlanta and Toronto um, that um, has human instructions. FAST is one for uh, kind of phonemics, phonemics and uh, letter sound correspondence, whereas PACES is comprehension. Then we have the computer auto tutor, and uh, so it's a hybrid sort of interaction, or I guess it's blended. That would be the proper way of putting it after reading, uh, after reading the book that, uh, that George wrote with his collaborators. So this is the adult paces comprehension, uh, prediction, acquiring vocabulary, clarifying common sources of confusions with questions, elaborating and evaluating, and summarizing. We've changed summarizing to text structure, okay? That's kind of changed, so we can keep the paces. Um, a lot of these, some of these people don't come in with uh, digital skills. So we have to 
train them on that, we've already assessed their digital skills with this North Star program that came out of uh, Minnesota. Uh, so we know what of their operations and skills they have. And some of them they have, some of them they don't have. And so we have to kind of get them up to digital, digital literacy. Interestingly, when we developed this, before we developed this, uh, we looked at existing digital tutorial, um, you know, trainers on the web. But small problem, you, need to do, you needed to know how to read in order to use it. <laughs> so we had to tailor this to people who had reading problems. So there's Cecil. This is the main can think of it as like an iPhone or Android sort of thing. And our agents are on the side. This is a tutor agent. This is a student, fellow student agent. We wanted them to be on the side. So eventually they might disappear. So we wanted the authentic, eventually the authentic interface, the ecological interface, and these guys were on the side. There's another good reason for putting them on the side. They don't notice any lack of uh, speech, lip, asynchronies when that happens. Okay. So we also wanted to focus on topics that were useful to them. Most of the materials on comprehension and reading that exist are for kids. It, it's boring and not useful to an adult. Um, so, uh, this is on drugs, uh, you know, reading uh, non-prescription sort of medicines and trying to get what they're after. Uh, here's one, another one, this looks at uh, different meanings of words and uh, here's a competition that Whitney, the human, has with Jordan, the tutor agent, and so uh, this competition can be uh, motivating, game-like. Uh, we have Jeopardy-like sort of exercises that can be motivating. Um, and you also see how risky they are. Uh, like, the, they choose the $100 item or the $400 item. Uh, we ran this on college students. They're very risk-pushy. They tend to ask at look at $400 items, even though a third of them don't do very well. Uh, but they have the illusion that they're good at it. And so you can look at risk on something like this as well as how well they're performing. Uh, here's cashing checks. That's important. That's a practical skill. We like practical skills like driving, cashing checks, uh, analyzing the procedure for taking a drug uh, very practical skills uh, that we are hopefully uh, keeping them engaged and they see the utility in it. Um, this is one on getting a GED and this is where they click on a sentence that, uh, that addresses some sort of question. Um, mind you, they can't type a lot. Even the better people who come out of the training, if they can write two, a three-sentence summary, they're way in the upper five percentile. So you have to have more clicks and slowly with training have them have typed input. So here's the scope and sequence of 30 of our lessons, 31 actually since it starts with zero. We've added four others that get into social media things, like Facebook, um, uh, email, and uh, there's one other uh, chat. And um, so we really now have 35 lessons. And we have to complete these by December. Uh, we've already tested these ones out on 52 adults in Toronto and Atlanta and we're modifying those, but we're gonna have 35 of these. Um, so, you look at their features, and, and part of the questions here is could we have a standalone system? 
that we that people in any kind of a kind of center adult literacy center that they could just use it and integrate it with whatever ways they teach them and th that's what we're hoping and to be picking George's brain and other people's brain to what would be a stable platform that we just give it to them and see how they use it at this point and how much teacher intervention is needed <clears throat> to get this off the ground. Maybe teachers can learn comprehension skills by using this. Um, they might, um, one thing we've learned is when we kind of go to the literacy centers and find out what they know about how much training they have, and we've done, we've, we've examined a sample of a thousand literacy center directors. A lot of the people have very little training on reading. And um, a lot of them are just volunteers in the community. Uh, uh, and uh, we don't go in there and give them a test, but we have, um, we're, from the information we've gathered from surveys, we're not convinced that they know comprehension skills. They know the simple sort of phonics, phonemic awareness, sound picture correspondence, simple things like that, basic reading, reading processes, but not comprehension processes. So we have these things, and we also have some self-directed reading activities, but um, this is, this is what the teacher's access page is. This is a classroom, and these are the various a subset of the various uh, modules they've completed. And then uh, this would be the students in one classroom. And this is what they look like at a snapshot of looking at their performance. And one question I have is, we've created this, how much could this be just put into an edX MOOC or any other MOOC that you have? Is, is it an easy transfer or is it a hard transfer? Um, uh, you can drill down on any of these performance things and we've got that and once again, how much, and we're doing data mining on this, um, how much can you just transport it over? Um, so we have done this feasibility study um, with 52 adults and for three months of training and interestingly, 71% of the lessons were completed by them. Now, attrition rates have been terrible in these adult uh, literacy classes. The typical, uh, you know, attrition rate, well, this is how many of them are completed. It's typical to be more like 14%. So, uh, we're happy about this. Of course, they know they're in a study. There may be a Rosenthal effect or something like that, or an author effect. But uh, still, we're encouraged, and their performance on any given lesson is about 55%. We do get a pretest to post-test learning gains on an objective measure of about, about 0.44 sigma. In the whole history of adult education on comprehension, the best they've ever gotten is 0.03 effect size. So we're encouraged, we're encouraged. And we're gonna be right, we had to get this thing finished now because starting in January, there's a two, there's a two year efficacy study on this and we've gotta have everything stable and ready to go for that. So we're encouraged by this. Um, before I get to this part, let me just ask a question. Um, or, there's a decision we could make between just taking our existing platform and just augmenting it with some of the social media and independent reading, or getting the independent reading and social interaction components in it with the current uh, platforms. 
And that's one question I have. And I don't know whether you know. You want, you want an answer now? Yeah. Or? Yes. Uh, so one of the challenges that we have, especially with large scale learning, uh -huh. I'll use the illustration of where we were in the 90s with mm -hmm. uh, learning management systems or early 2000s. There was a large number of universities that were writing and developing their own learning management systems. Mm -hmm. The proprietary vendors were developing their systems at such a rapid pace that mm -hmm. every school eventually, even though some had invested tens of millions of dollars in programming, in some cases I know some systems that had you know, a robust programming crew, you just couldn't keep up. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to find that as learning at scale matures mm -hmm. and it's centralizing more and more around a small number of providers, mm -hmm. Prominent ones being Coursera, mm -hmm. edX, and uh, Canvas would probably mm -hmm. be the three biggest mm -hmm. spaces now. There's a few like Novo Ed and others that you're aware of that have more of a social component, learner profile mm -hmm. component. But uh, my instinct would be to engage with an open source platform that mm -hmm. allows you to write code and commit it back to the community. Mm -hmm. And the only one that fits that profile right now is edX or open edX. Okay. The benefit then is that you can also take advantage of, there's a number, because edX is open, there's a number of researchers that are starting to contribute code and functionality or module functionality to that. You also have the ability with edX to use LTI, the, mm -hmm. uh, the like technology, the learning technology integration, which then allows you to add functionality to your site by just as simple as clicking in and you've got a Piazza discussion board if you'd like Great. to do that. So that that's what we're and, and there's a list of hundreds of tool sets that sit in an, in an LTI compatible marketplace that you can basically bring into an open edX site with literally the click of a button. So, so that sounds like that's the way to go. Well, yeah. I'm a bit biased because I sure. one favor openness, but secondly, mm -hmm. I do think that large scale learning platforms are going to go the same pathway as the original uh, LMSs did, mm -hmm. which is that you just can't keep programming at a pace that matches what hundreds, even thousands of programmers are doing, especially in an open space. For the next two years, you'll likely be competitive with whatever you're developing internally, but it's the integration of the functionalities of the tool sets that are going to quickly make any homegrown solutions obsolete, or at least subpar for user performance. Yeah, yeah. And uh, my colleague, Sheng Yin Hu, is totally in agreement on that. So the question is, what can we keep with the agents uh, in order to transport it over to edX with the other capability. Well, one option you could be, which would then make your agents more broadly available to mm -hmm. other platforms, is to enable LTI integration, mm -hmm. which then means any course mm -hmm. on edX would be able to use your agents. Now, because of programming and developing the agents, is obviously a complex task that may minimize its broad adoption, but we did our, uh, in our course last year, we used ProSolo with one that we ran, which is a software product that uh, Dragon Gasovich initiated and I've been involved with for a number of years. After that was done, because we found the value of the LTI integration, we ended up uh, making that platform LTI compatible, which means anyone now on edX, we haven't made it available broadly, but anyone on edX could use ProSolo within their existing learning. And basically ProSolo is a social competency learning platform. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in your case, you could do, if you wanted to mm -hmm. go through it, but you could make your um, tutor systems LTI Compatible. Which, by the way, we are doing that and have done it through GIF, this generalized intelligent framework for tutoring, where our authoring tools and our ACE are open source. So and it's, but the nice thing with LTI is that yeah. it's basically, it doesn't alter the core code, it just enables a structured data exchange between these two systems so mm -hmm. that you don't get to see everything, they don't get to see everything, but you can parse data back and forth, which then allows anyone to use AutoTutor with with edX, for example. And the nice thing is you could potentially <coughs> open that then to a broader development community that may contribute to your open source version. Which would be great. Yeah. yeah. One thing uh, yeah. you might find of interest, now I know I had talked to you about this before, mm -hmm. is whether together with UTA, because we do have a very diverse population, mm -hmm. the fifth most diverse campus in the US as of last year or something, mm -hmm. which means if the stats that you hold, that you listed mm -hmm. earlier, a third of college students yeah. only read at an eighth grade level, uh -huh. I would actually suggest at a at a very diverse campus, you may actually have a greater percentage mm -hmm. of the population reading at that level. But this gets back to the talk that you and I had earlier, which is I don't think you can train, I don't think you can only address completion rates for at-risk students without educating the whole family. Mm -hmm. And so something like this could be an interesting MOOC project if you want to partner with us for LINK yeah. 
to help with some of the design activities and uh, some of the transition from your existing platform into the edX space. Uh, I think, I, and I'd have to chat with, I'm not sure if Pete is, he's hiding there. So, um, Pete would love to fund it. <laughs> no, but on a serious note, it's a relevant project for us on campus. And I do think if we're going to really address underrepresented populations, we have to start thinking of the student and start thinking of the family unit. And having a, an adult literacy movement would be, I think, very valuable. And we could probably do it with minimal cost inputs in terms of design. You've already invested in the resources. Mm -hmm. We would have to invest in uh, designers to move the system to an edX platform yep. mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. offer it as a jointly offered mm -hmm. course, basically, mm -hmm. in, within the edX platform. So I don't know, do you have any takes or thoughts on that? Having missed most of the talk, I'll, I'll travel towards that. And mm -hmm. you know, this notion of interchangeability between systems is key. In essence, mm -hmm. what we're doing is not altering your work. Other environments that you suggested Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was a part of an evaluation of a course, Texas um, Higher Education Coordinating Board grant, and mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but I can't recall the name of the program now. And their job was to take students who perhaps didn't graduate from high school and in small cohorts to prepare them for college mm -hmm. and help them make that transition. And I can definitely see where some tool like this would. You know, be a wonderful part of that. Having evaluated just about three or four of the different programs that they had, and that was just a you know mm -hmm. a, a thought mm -hmm. that I had. I could see they mm -hmm. could make use of it, of course, in whatever way that it was available. But it was something that I think would be a wonderful addition to what their work was. That would be splendid, yeah. and uh, we we want to get it out there and being being used. Yeah. I've done research on um, adult literacy in the uh -huh. DFW area, and I would I would suggest three. Mm -hmm. Sectors for partnering um, libraries, mm -hmm. nonprofits, and, and like you said, they're underutilized. They, um, but the third one, interestingly, here in the Bible Belt is a faith based adult literacy organizations, and they're huge. I don't know that they, get, I don't know how successful they are, um, but those three are primarily where people turn to for you, adult you literacy. You are so you'd have to partner right. with all three of those sectors. And in fact, we are in Memphis. I mean, and, and in the state of Tennessee, the state level, um, we are very sensitive to that. In fact, Andrew Olney, I don't know if you remember him, uh, when he, he's the director of the Institute for Intelligent Systems. I don't know if he was there when you were here. But um, he is now doing a laptop study, not a laptop, a tabloid study for independent reading where they can access simple English Wikipedia in a faith-based organization called HopeWorks. And, um, and interestingly, they have about 700 of them there, but, they, um, uh, but their goal is to get them to get a job. And so that's one thing we do. The other is Literacy Mid-South, which is connected to all these libraries, but also, geez, trailers in some place, mobile homes, and just trying to get out in the community because a big thing is transportation. In Memphis, at least, sometimes it takes two hours to get there and two hours back because our transportation system in Memphis is absolutely pathetic. Um, and uh, you, should, uh, you should use some public transportation here in Arlington. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you mention that. It That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I guess just to, just to yeah. nail this down, yeah. though, Art, just as right. an FYI, right. so it sounds like with some uh, yeah. Peggy's background and, and interests yep. and the work that you're doing there at the mm -hmm. end on Link, uh, I know we briefly talked about this when I was visiting you, but mm -hmm. uh, it might be worth seeing, is there an actionable next step for collaboration between what you're doing with CISO and what we're doing with Link and learning at scale? Yes, uh, there is, and let me just address that as an actionable item. I go to the IESPI meeting in Washington early December, where I want to go there and say that this is our intention. And I want an approximate budget on how much it would cost, and they may interact with, highly likely we would be working with Octe. That's, Octe is the old Ove. Uh, Octe is, oh dear, but the initials, Office of Career training and adult education. That's what it used to be, OVE, adult vocational 
vocational <coughs> and adult education, something like that. Office of Vocation and Adult Education. They changed their name, and they're very interested in this. And so I need a budget, and you're the partner to be doing it with, and it fits in with what we're doing here. So um, I think that's something we should Let's make sure we next follow next. up on that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so one uh, thing we wanted to say is we are very sensitive to the reading level. We want to get at what they're interested in. Because we think, I think, that you can give these strategies, but if you don't have them independently reading and reading a lot, it's just not going to work very well. So we've got these inventories and repositories of text where we try to cater to their interests, things that are relevant to adult lives, not too easy or difficulty. We have these items scaled on uh, co-metrics on complexity. So these are some of the uh, items, categories that they have, uh, appealing both to females and males. Um, and then um, you, so this is a repository that was created. Right now we also have them access simple English Wikipedia and also um, this news uh, site, newspaper articles, and we're trying to get them to be actually reading. Uh, but this is the other part that we learned. When, when I was on the panel with the National Academy of Sciences for Adolescent and Adult Education, two recommendations were very clear. One is they need to be exposed to technology to give them the opportunity to uh, open the doors to this. The second is they have to have social interaction with peers and teachers, and it may be now family you speak of, uh, to improve uh, that social interaction. Because that keeps them in the loop. Because a lot of them, there's a big attrition rate. And if somebody's sending them, whether it's a Facebook message or uh, chat or whatever, some messages say, where are you? Uh, that is very important to handle the attrition problem. And so that's where I'm particularly interested in whether it's ProSolo or whatever uh, technologies to keep the social interaction going. So between that and more independent reading, and we want them to get more autonomous control in some way after they start getting their wings on this. And, um, and so uh, that's what I, that's what the vision is. I have this other thing on learning um, on this game, but I don't think, I think I'd rather talk about this more. All I want to say about the game is it was very frustrating working with Pearson Education, <laughs> but I find out everybody has that story, so that's probably old news. Um, but, um, but thank you very much, and ideas on this whole literacy way, and uh, I'd like to figure out a way to give them, to answer the question, how much intervention do you need to give them? To get them started to where they can be using this more autonomously. So what's the minimal amount of intervention at a literacy center before there's enough affordances in this technology to where between the independent reading, the social media, and these lessons that they'll be going on their own. And if you can help me figure out that problem, that would be great. Yeah, that should be an easy one because uh, <laughs> the, uh, I think the community of inquiry model would be useful here. And uh, some of the work with a student I supervise with Dragon has been looking at automating community of inquiry determination, just because you mentioned those key points, teacher presence, yeah. uh, the social presence, and then related more to, to the content or the resources yeah. that individuals are engaged in. Mm -hmm. so, and I think it's going to be variable because there's cultural factors that are going to come in, as you're well aware, being in diverse communities or having a diverse population. So I think in the end, what you'll probably best want to try and articulate is naming the variables that are at play and having a flexible model for whether it's a spire graph or some a model like that that allows you to convey the prevalence of those different attributes for 
not just different population, but different individuals. I think they're going to be in different cultures as well. There will likely be gender distinctions too in terms of your desire to speak openly and publicly, desire to socialize and other factors. So I don't think it'll be a single answer. Yeah, the, 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 you want to ac a lot, accommodate many combinations. Some don't have a family. Some um, in their different families have different cultures. Do you need, do you want an oral uh, uh, communication channel or how much is their chat? How much chat can they do? I, uh, these are questions that nobody knows the answer to. Uh, and, but having the ability, different combinations, it's going to be interesting if you do this on a system like edX and run it as an edX MOOC. So you'll likely yeah. see 20, 30. I mean, in fact, the biggest MOOC that's been done traditionally was done on OpenLearn. And it was a MOOC on basically teaching English, uh, you know, as a second language or English, you know, in terms of qualifications of demonstrating English proficiency. Mm -hmm. And so what you're doing in a number of ways is a similar focal point. I think you could quite quickly have a very large MOOC on your hands that could have very different populations with very different views of literacy. Um, yes. yep. And this uh, Kevin Dean, who has this network of literacy centers in the Mid-South area, uh, like about a hundred, uh, you could find out their different combinations and of different cultures. Yeah. Did you have a Yeah, I had a People, I've tutored adults, ESL mm -hmm. and Dallas, and many of the um, students didn't have a computer at home. Is mm -hmm. this something that's mobile driven, or how can you scale that yeah. up given that, you know, I mean, they would come with their notebooks and just kind of expect the old school just take notes and write everything down, and how do you yeah. overcome those traditional ways and lack of access to computer? I mean, I'm not saying that's, yeah. it might be typical, it seems typical. And it was such a small, like they had like five literacy sites for Dallas, and the needs are hu huge. They were just scratching the surface. There's so much potential. I know, and we uh, we bought we bought these fifty. Oh, what was the name of the systems? They're like fire. What is it called? Fire system. They're less than a hundred dollars, and they have limited capabilities, and this is accessing simple English Wikipedia. Uh, and I wish Andrew was here who could give you more of the technical details on it. But they can do, do it at home. And then they bring in their uh, tablet or whatever and um, to the literacy center, and they're supposed to go there twice a week. But he's recording what they do at home. Which news articles do they get? And they're categorized in various ways. Um, so he can track it. Now, ideally, what we want is um, access to the internet 24-7. And um, we were excited at one point when Obama was talking about certain neighborhoods that would have free internet access. And certainly Memphis would be one that would probably be high on his list because we actually, one of our uh, zip codes is the third poorest zip code in the United States, poorest in Texas, T Tennessee. And if that was all uh, networked and even got some sort of grant to make it free instead of $15 a month, and we still don't know what that means. When they say $15 a month for internet access, what does that mean? Or is that 15, but they add on all these other things? We don't know. But that's the, that's the way we're going. It's getting away these, um, in fact, they get at the end of uh, the study, they get to keep this, uh, this uh, tablet. Um, they get to keep it, so that's an incentive for finishing, and if they could just have permanent access. Of course, we know the United States is going to be networked in the entire country for free, right? within two years, right? Uh, that would be ideal, but it, access is a big thing. That's yeah. a good reason for your faith-based direction is that you're making use of the connections that are available, perhaps maybe Wi-Fi connections within the church or at different places. I mean, I know we can't get everybody to go to McDonald's with a free Wi-Fi, but 
and it, you know that the same is it, you know the structure that you work with might be able to provide those things. I know and, you, and, you, and you mentioned the library. Um, yeah. Our library does have kind of spotty internet access. You know that we tested it out at the beginning and. We looked at all the portions of the library where the internet access was stable and it's spotted. Yeah. So just one okay, final question and then yeah. I just want to wrap up. First, yeah. Dan Collins, every kid in his 15,000 district connected. So that, that's, he probably has some idea. Huh. Yeah. 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 Connectivity is concerned. I would think that public schools would be the the natural station for that because they are neighborhood based. They're numerous, um, and, it, and it's to everybody's advantage that not only the students but the parents and everybody in the family have as much access as they can have. And it it could be driven as a piggyback to. Uh, to the purchase of hardware or software, or other kinds of things, you know, from similar or same vendors or vendor partnerships. And a number of literacy centers are in schools. There, there's one drawback statistically, you know, it's not for all of them, but statistically, is some of them have firewalls and certain restrictions. Uh, that's the one thing that you have to work out with their Technology person. Can around. I ask an ignorant question yeah. about the, yeah. the uh, expert and the fellow student and that that trilog is that a what's the capability of the expert, for example, to to modify or respond to questions that you couldn't have programmed? Mm -hmm. the interact with? Is it a Siri type of a... It, um, it, it, excellent question. Um, it can't handle all questions. A subset of questions it can handle and it answers those. And of course you can expand the set of these over time uh, to... So after so much cycles of engineering it's rare in number. When it can't handle a question it just comes back and say that's a great question. How would you answer it? <laughs> and you know, uh, and it turns the hot potato back onto them when it can't handle the questions. This is part of some of the conversational moves that you need to do, just so you can handle any input. So it throws it back on them. It's a great question. I don't know. How would you answer it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, for, yeah. for the sake of time, and because yeah. we want to uh, subject you to some eye motions testing, sure. and. Uh, <laughs> Thanks very much, Art, okay. for a terrific talk. Thanks for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.